Yes. Um, um, well, I've, I've spent nearly my entire working career um, in the same laboratory, which now spans over 30 years. It seems difficult to understand that, but uh, it is just the way my career went. Um, I came in as a 19-year-old with A-levels, and I had to go to college to do a higher national diploma, HND. Um, and I, after th two years, completed that. And then <coughs> I then went on to do a fellowship at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences qualification in cellular pathology, which is a three-year course, again, part-time. And <coughs> I did rather well in that um, and got a, a prize for my performance in that exam. And then from that, I guess I was motivated enough to want to go on and study further, so I did a management qualification for a year before going back to academia and wanting to do a Master of Science in Immunology. At this time, it was at Surrey University. So I finished that and, and got a distinction there and was able then um, to complement both my histopathology understanding with the fellowship exam with my increased knowledge of immunology with the master's exam. So in many ways, I was duly qualified in two disciplines, really. And then I started writing quite a lot of publications, actually before I did the master's, but ongoing from that for several years. And uh, I then had an opportunity, because I was lecturing at various universities and asked to help out with various courses, that uh, I should try and do a PhD. And I had already ma amassed a reasonable number of papers by then. And so I did it by publication. They were peer-reviewed and they were published, so that my PhD was achieved by publication. And uh, I passed that in 2010. Um, and so throughout my career, which is relatively recent, getting to the end of that point, 2010, only six, seven years ago, um, I've been studying for a period of on-off for 13 years part-time. So it's a long, long uh, journey. But one that I thoroughly enjoyed and that I found very stimulating. And the most pleasing thing is, I guess, that I still feel, even now, I'm still learning more and more things. And so for me, it really has been a pathway of continuing development. To cap it off, I was fortunate enough to be appointed the Chief Examiner for the Institute of Biomedical Sciences in Cellular Pathology at the beginning of 2016, which is roughly where we are now. Uh, and I'm enjoying that role as well. So um, yes, I, I can only say it's been a, a very long journey, but a very enjoyable one. That's a good question. Um, I guess most 17 year olds, 16, 15, whatever time you start deciding what you may want to do in your career, it's very difficult to know exactly what you want to do at that age, and I was no different. But I had a, an inkling, a flair, if you like, uh, for science generally, particularly biology, uh, and I felt that I should choose a profession that had science in it, um, and my mother was very encouraging in that sense. Um, and I thought, I always thought the NHS was a good employer and I'd seen it on the television many, many times and various TV shows and documentaries and I thought that it would be a, a good career for me to, to look, at, look at doing. Um, and I decided that I could go in an A-level stage and, and study whilst still working and I felt that was probably suitable for me as a person to do it like that. It doesn't suit everybody, um, but I guess if you start early and young, you, you get used to it. And for me, it was a journey of 13 years, as I said, to qualify through all the various things that I did and I chose to do. But I was very used to it. I was used to working at weekends and studying in the, in the week. It didn't, um, it didn't um, pose a problem for me. So that's the real reason. I, I had an inkling. I, I, I loved it when I started. I enjoyed it. And I kept um, wanting to study more. So for me, it was a, a continual pathway. Um, yes, uh, I'm, I work in a, a laboratory that is uh, a national referral centre for uh, skin pathology and, uh, or histopathology. So we deal with lots of tissues that are sent to us from all over the country from other histopathology services that require help or assistance or support in diagnosing uh, invariably cancers of the skin, which is by far the most frequent thing that we deal with. So melanomas and lymphomas of the skin we, we see quite commonly here. And the other thing that we do over at Guy's, it's an annex laboratory, is we do facial surgery for, for tumour removal 
That process is called Mohs micrographic surgery, where we remove tumours from the face um, with minimal normal tissue uh, being removed. So it's cosmetically a, a much better end product. And so my staff and I engage in, in that laboratory to assist the surgeons um, producing sections for them to look at so they can evaluate complete tumour removal from these, these patients. That's essentially what we do. Um, right, with, within the, the service here, um, I'm the operational lead for the uh, histopathology or dermatopathology, as we like to call it, services, and that encompasses running the diagnostic main laboratory, which deals with all the routine investigations and uh, cutting of uh, sections for H&E staining, which is the, the primary stain that they use, and also to oversee the immunocytochemistry service, where we try to uh, type tumours according to antibody and antigen uh, reactions so we can classify tumours more effectively. Uh, I oversee that. I also oversee the trichogram service, which is in actual fact a very specialist service where we analyse patients who have alopecia, which is surprisingly common, um, and people don't always know what caused alopecia. So through histological investigations and by looking at their hair, which is what the trichograms are, we can ascertain causative reasons as to why they have hair loss. So we do that, and the last component is the Mohs micrographic surgery, where we excise with the surgical teams and analyse tumours uh, which are invariably removed from the facial sites um, and hopefully completely remove their cancers in a day visit and uh, cosmetically uh, preserve their tissue so that they don't have uh, larger wounds than they would not necessarily uh, like or need. Um, because we minimally excise the tumour, just taking what we need and no more. So it's a specialist technique um, and it does take an awful lot of time and all my staff are engaged in, in that service as well. That's a good question. Um, I guess when I first came in as a young, fresh-faced teenager, uh, I didn't know quite what to expect. So I kept my head down and worked hard. Um, but what has surprised me, and it's probably why I've been able to continue in the way that I have, is that in this particular environment, I was encouraged quite early on to develop an academic uh, side to my, to my work. And it's like a bug that bites you. Once you've had that, you, you don't really want to let it go. So you learn all your routine tests and investigations, but at the same time, you, you become increasingly involved with research and, 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 and developing strategies for studying and then finding out new things. And that's been the case for me almost from early days. And it's followed me through to where I am now. So I guess it surprised me in the sense that I had that opportunity. Um, it's not something that I'm aware is openly available to all, but it, it was available to me and I grasped it. Uh, the highlights are the, and I think this is a benefit, some may say that it's not, but, uh, but I think it is. I think it's the responsibility and the accountability. So I know I have to make some decisions which affect not just the patients that, that we investigate and we do the tests for, but also the staff that I have with me, that work with me. And I take it quite seriously that I want to make sure that their career paths are as open and as expansive as they can be, as, as much as I can make them. And, and so that's, for me, a plus, that I'm able to keep an eye on my staff and, and encourage my staff as best as I can. I enjoy that side of my work. I also enjoy seeing them taking part in research work, because it reminds me of what I did when I was their age, because that, that opportunity isn't always there for many people, but, but I try to instill that in them. So those are the positives. The negatives, it's a long road. There's lots of things to have to, exams you have to sit, um, and courses you have to do. And, and some of it you may wonder at the time you're doing it, is this the right thing that I should be doing? Is this really what I want to do? There'll be the occasional doubt in your mind. And sometimes you have to do things that you don't necessarily enjoy in that process. But the end result is a rounded, complete package. So I always take the view, yes, you may not think that's best for you, 
when I talk to my staff, but I'm saying, believe me, I think that is what you need to do. And to encourage them to try and uh, pursue that. And, and likewise, when I went through it, I had the same views. Uh, but, but I don't regret any of it. So in many ways, my negatives are positives. Yes, it's a very good question, and uh, again, the answer is most definitely. Um, science never stands still for more than a, a few seconds, frankly, and um, there is always new developments, and yeah, they are sometimes quite far-reaching in, the, in, the, in their effect and the consequences. There is need for retraining, new skills to be learned. This is a constant requirement in science, and uh, that's been the case with me. I remember doing everything manually by hand when I started. Now, most of what I did by hand is, is, is automated or semi-automated in some shape or form. Um, some people feel that that's not necessarily a good thing, but it's a necessity. So I, I embraced it uh, when it came around, and I realized the potential to expand and increase your, your repertoire of tests by doing that. Some people worry that they'll lose skills if they have an automated machine to do things that they used to do by hand. This is a myth because machines are only as good as what you tell them to do and how you program them. And you still have to assess the end product that they produce. And sometimes it's wrong. But you need to have the knowledge and the skills to understand when it is wrong, and you need to know what the corrective actions are to put it right. So I look at them as glorified monkeys, really. They do what you tell them to do, pipette things on the slides and do that in a very accurate way. But they will only do what you tell them to do. So essentially, that's the limitations of the automated platforms, but the potential for increased capacity and expansion of service is far and away superior with, those, with that approach. And so I think those are the, the main things. The examples of where we've introduced automation extensively include immunocytic chemistry, which is now almost completely automated, um, but needs to be because of the volumes of work we're doing. In situ hybridization, I remember going into a dark room once, turning the lights off and sitting in there for five, six hours and producing 12 slides. Now you can put it on a machine and get 30 and run it overnight. So these are the changes that have happened. Uh, but they're beneficial changes and it all benefits patient care and patient outcomes because you can get results quicker, more accurately, more reproducibly, and it standardizes a lot of the manual procedures that we used to do all by hand. So I think this is a very positive move. Yes. Um, I, I, I'm, I work within the framework of the NHS, although I'm not actually an NHS employee anymore. Um, what's happening in the NHS labs is that there's been a significant change from the working practices in the terms that you were always under NHS terms and conditions to moving towards a more private or semi-private arrangement. Um, that brings issues around staffing, skill mixes and recruitment retention problems that you all have to battle with and adjust with. And uh, this is going to happen across the whole country. It's happening now, it's going to continue to happen, and this is the way of the future. Um, but it does mean that it can be quite difficult sometimes to, to get the workforces and the skills that you need to maintain a service that, in my case, is, is still expanding. So I think that's a big challenge for me, to get the right staff in with the right level of commitment and uh, enthusiasm to want to study further. And actually retaining the staff is a big issue. I spend quite a lot of time teaching staff to be proficient at specialised, detailed skills. If they leave, I have to start again. It's another six-month period of training them to get them to back what, what the skills that I've lost when I lose a, a key member of staff. This is a big problem, um, not just for my lab, for many labs. So I think that's it's about your workforce because automation has dictated a lot of this change you need to have the intelligence and skills to support that automation with your work staff. So getting that balance right is the biggest challenge that I feel in my working environment. I take the science in my stride generally. It doesn't worry me, but I worry about my staff skills mixes. Yes, I think, uh, I wish we had a crystal ball and we could be absolutely clear about what the future holds, but. Uh, 
if we put the uh, the issue of the politics and the mergers and amalgamations that happen in laboratories these days uh, as being something that you have no control over um, uh, to one side, uh, then you're left with the requirement of making sure you've got a proficient and efficient working uh, workforce and that you are also able to adapt. That's key. You are able to adapt to whatever changes that you are going to be facing in your working environment. And I think that's key. I think if your staff are aware of that, the younger they are, the more they are aware of that, or more able they are to adjust to that. I think that's very important. Science always brings new uh, developments. The main thing at the moment is, is whatever's going on in genetics seems to dictate what the rest of us uh, in other fields may be doing in the future, uh, invariably in a supportive capacity. And cellular pathology is very much in that. I do believe genetics will dictate a lot of the way that we uh, deal with cancers uh, in the future. It already is doing that and it will continue to do that. Uh, the role of the supportive uh, services like mine um, remains to be fully elucidated, but I cannot see them not wanting to use an H&E stain slide, even if they've got a genetic profile. So I think uh, the future is assured in that sense.